Welcome to my session of Pitfalls and Practical Solutions on Exonix 2020 Event Driven Microservices Conference. My name is Jan Hendrik Kuperis. I've been a software developer for about 15 years now and been working with Axon Framework for the past five years on several projects. Um, today, this session uh, will be about some of our design decisions that we've made in these, uh, these projects, uh, things we ran into using those. Um, design decisions, as well as some of the situations we've been running into when using the application in production. Uh, this is a pre-recorded session, which means I will not be able to answer to questions within the session, but I will be available on the chat uh, during the conference, um, answering questions there while the session is running. So let's have a look at some of the things that are in the session and some of the things that are not. Uh, since this is a relatively short session, um, it's a good idea, to, good idea to know what you want, what you can expect. Um, obviously, we're using Axon Framework, which is in context. Um, I will also be talking a bit about the architecture of our application. Um, there's uh, Scala here, which you can see is both inside and outside of the, the circle. Uh, that's because we're using it as a main language of our application. Uh, but we're, I'm actually not talking about it today because last year I had a talk about how we use Scala to run Axon Framework uh, on uh, Axonix uh, 2019 uh, conference. I think there's a recording of that uh, still online, uh, so you can uh, look it up. Uh, there will also not be any code samples today. Um, mostly we'll be talking about the lessons learned. Um, they will, uh, we are not using Axon Server. That's because our application actually predates Axon Server. Uh, so most of the things we we're talking about are about running your own database underneath Axon. Um, and uh, almost uh, in the same line of that is uh, there is Spring Boot. Uh, it's also outside of the circle um, because uh, we are well, we are using Spring Boot to launch the application, but we're actually not using any of Axon's uh, Spring Boot auto configuration features. And that's mostly because we want to have control over some of these configurations. Um, and, and there will be a few um, of these in this session about how we uh, work with that to uh, put Axon in, uh, in a shape and configuration where we actually want it. Here's a small overview of the stack of uh, technologies we are using. Um, some of these I won't go into depth, but they give a bit of an overview of how our system is built from the components. Uh, one of the things that should be obvious right away is that it matches the microservice uh, pattern for our command handlers, its own service. The projections are their own service, as well as a service uh, that delivers the view model back to the UI. Uh, and these are all independent services running uh, in their own JVM being orchestrated over our um, infrastructure and running and scaling in as much as we need it. Uh, all of these components write their information to uh, CockroachDB uh, and you can see the flow of data um, that's typical in an event source application. We, we have commands arriving at the command handler uh, which emits events. These events are read by our projection services uh, these services generate some other type of model from it, in this case a view model, writes that over to the view model database, from which our service view model reads the view model again and serves it back to the UI. Um, well, you can see all of these uh, applications of ours are running on Scala. Uh, that's because we are using Scala as the main platform for all our development. Um, Below Scala, there's the AVM and a lot of more technology to make sure this all runs over our infrastructure as much as possible. And at the top, you can see Nginx, which is not relevant for the rest of this uh, link, this talk. And on the left side here, you can see that our application has a secondary input uh, for system-to-system -system messages, and that's running through Kafka. So the previous view showed only one projection. Uh, it was more of an overview of all the, the different components of our uh, event sourcing flow. 
but in reality, we have more like three uh, projections at this time. Um, this diagram here shows the three we have at the, at the moment. It's one for the view model, one for our search cluster, and one for our audit log. Uh, these three uh, projections are all independent services. Uh, they run separately from each other, um, and uh, they can be turned on and off as needed uh, to do some maintenance, and none of the other ones will be impacted. Uh, we chose this setup uh, specifically from the start to be evolutionary. Um, we, we simply created the projections that we needed for our application first, and whenever um, other parties within the client um, are looking for ways to interact with our application, uh, for example, they need an export of certain types of information, uh, then what we ask is, um, what does this data have to look like? Um, what are the retention uh, policies? Uh, what kind of database do you want it in? And based on these uh, types of questions, we will create a projection specifically for them. And using this model, we are um, fairly free to add um, external parties and uh, users of our data as we need. Um, so creating a new projection will never impact any of the other projections and uh, doing maintenance on one of them will also never um, impact any of the other projections. And this uh, allows us the, the freedom to evolve our application over time um, to um, include other departments step by step and to have operational uh, independence between these various projections. So from this um, this architecture, here's a the first tip we uh, did, um, and it's about token location. Normally, when you create a, a, a tracking event processor in uh, Axon, uh, the uh, uh, Spring Boot configuration modules will uh, create the, the token store in the same database as the event store. And this is not necessarily a, a problem. Um, because in a lot of situations, especially if you're just writing a small application, everything will probably be in the same database. Uh, and so the, the, that's why Spring Boot defaults to using the same database for the token as, as it does for the event stream. Uh, but there's a bit of a drawback here, because all of the processes constantly pull the, the token entry table. They put quite a bit of load on the, on the database that contains the event stream. Uh, this is something we, uh, we said, well, we don't want to do this from the beginning uh, because we, were, um, we, uh, we had the intention from the start to have multiple projections and uh, all of them be independent from each other. Uh, so we decided not, not to uh, do this, but to try and uh, find a different way. And instead, we are putting the token, and therefore uh, the token entry table, for every projection inside the database of that particular projection. And this means that um, it only uh, impacts the database of the projection itself, and it does not um, ex excessively pull the event stream database. Um, it pulls its own database and only when it sees um, uh, sees new events, then it will query those new events from the event stream. And um, orchestration uh, for the, the various segments and things, it all happens within the database of the projection. And this also means that it's completely isolated from other projections. Um, there's no way uh, a, a second projection uh, can accidentally use the same token, for example, when you create a second project and copy-paste all of the configuration and by accident use the same name for your processing group, then you, um, in the original situation you might have a problem where two projections are using the same token uh, while they're being um, completely different projections, and that will lead to, well, undefined, but probably very un un very bad behavior. Um, it's also very easy to restart. 
uh, a projection. Um, it's basically nothing more than dropping the database. Uh, when, when you do that, all of the tokens will also be destroyed. And the next time you start your tracking event processes, they will simply start from the first event ever. Uh, so, so this gives us uh, the freedom to develop projections completely separately from all other applications and there's less overhead in thinking what other projections would be impacted by these uh, by this particular projection. So, and the second tip. The second tip is about domain types. When we started building our system, um, we thought it was a good idea um, to combine all domain classes in one single project where all the other services would depend on. It turned out this was not a very good idea. Since uh, uh, in this way, the command handler and all the projections and all the services all use the same domain types, um, we essentially created a situation where in every change we did that impacted the domain even a little bit would mean we had to update all of our services and um, basically do big bang release to um, make sure everybody is talking the same uh, model again. Um, this seemed like a good idea the first time, um, purely out of um, object oriented um reasons but it was um we quickly learned that it was not manageable over time especially not when the number of services is growing uh, so we stopped using this and we said uh, we need more local domain classes and that's why we created separate uh, separate packages between every uh two um, between every two types of services. So the command handler uh, creates events, obviously it emits events. Those events will be defined in a project containing only the events. And um, all of the projection services depend on that package containing the events. Um, and each projection creates a new set of view model classes. Um, which are specific to that projection, which means that the service using those view um, domain objects also has a dependency on just those classes and not on a central domain class. And um, for the well, our auditing projection, for example, doesn't have any service um, using it. It simply writes directly into Elasticsearch. So it's only dependent on our central store of events. And um, we are in the, in the process of taking this one step further by going to the events um, project and splitting it up in uh, sub events to make sure that we, we have more clear boundaries between uh, certain types of events that may or may not be needed by all projections. This will make our release cycles even simpler uh, because every time we um, update something that's only for interesting for the view model, we will only be updating this particular branch of our product uh, and not having to propagate the same uh, or new versions of classes of things we're not using in this part of the application. So think about that when you are de um, designing your application, especially when you're using microservices. I mean, if you're building a big monolith, um, then actually the left uh, left side is not not a problem uh, because everything will reside within the same deployable unit, and then it's fine. Right. So that was about um, so much for domain location. The next thing we want to talk about is domain serialization. Uh, one of the things we've learned, especially with the uh, basically the contracts between multiple services, is that you don't want to be too strict. Um, strictness, strictness makes evolution hard because when something changes just a little bit, everything downstream will break. 
And when everything downstream breaks, you, that means you have to be more careful about planning your releases. Uh, your releases will become bigger and there will be more chances for failure when you're trying to release your feature. Um, and this is actually a bit of a downside for, for using uh, Jackson for serializing things because Jackson is by default um, very strict about new fields. Uh, if you've ever used Jackson, you will probably recognize this exception where it says, uh, I've found a field on, the, on a serialized object that's not defined in your object. So I'm simply rejecting this entire object and um, I'll give you a nice exception um, where we uh, where you can just go and find out what the problem is. Um, so what we've we've done here uh, is a very simple one. Basically, we told Jackson to ignore fields it doesn't know, and this means that when we are um, expanding our domain by simply adding fields, this will not break um, current uh, projections that are um, still using older classes. They will simply read the event um, and miss that extra field. But since they are not using that extra field, this is no problem. Um, a next tip here is when we're talking about serialization anyway, uh, we found it very helpful to be testing our seri serialization. Uh, especially when we're working again in microservices, things are happening independently, different team members are working on different parts of the system, and things can go wrong. And when things go wrong in serialization, uh, things can go seriously wrong. So what we want to do here is, this is a bit of a open door here. We, of course, we want to find bugs fast. Um, we, we don't want to find out about a uh, serialization error when we've deployed the application to the environment and it has started to uh, process events for which it has, for example, been unable to uh, deserialize them from the event stream. Um, this when this happens, normally um, an event processor simply reports the error and if your handling doesn't uh, stop the event processor from continuing, it will simply go on and basically skip the event that it couldn't read. Uh, and that's a situation we usually want to prevent because um, when events get skipped, we need to go back and repair that situation either by restarting the tracking event processor or writing some other tracking event processor to patch up uh, the events that have been missed. And, and that's not something we want to be doing. Um, so what we're doing here is we make the expectations for both serialization and deserialization um, explicit. And this will, um, uh, this means we, we create, we take concrete examples of, of serialized events, put them in our tests and um, um, make sure the application is able to um, deserialize them before we release it to the environment. Like I said, it's, it prevents a need for repairs. Repairs are costly. And event processors will simply skip over events if it can't deserialize them. So how do we do that? Well, we have actually um, a series of tests uh, that use uh, pre-serialized test events. Um, and um, all of these events should be uh, deserialized correctly by a tracking event processor before we allow it to run in our uh, environment. The next topic is on CockroachDB. We've been running our application, like I said, it's, we're not running on Axon Server. We've been running our application before Axon Server um, was full and well released. Um, and initially we were using uh, MariaDB. Uh, MariaDB is the open source um, fork of MySQL. And it, it works, it works very nicely. Uh, but there is a problem with MariaDB nowadays in that it is, uh, it is taking a lot of time uh, to maintain it in a, um, in a clustered formation. And especially in the project where we were working, there wasn't 
uh, were not enough team members that were familiar with how to maintain a cluster of MariaDB uh, services, and that simply posed a risk to our application. So we decided at some point to change <coughs> the database we're using, and we came up with uh, CockroachDB because it's a cloud-native um, SQL compatible database. Uh, we've been running a few tests with it, and Axon actually just works fine with it, um, thanks to its uh, Postgres wire compatibility. So uh, CockroachDB has allowed us to um, deploy multiple uh, nodes very easily. Uh, most of my team members know how to add nodes, remove nodes, and the, the entire database is simply uh, clustered from the beginning. Uh, there is, however, one, one little gotcha. When we first uh, started to work with uh, CockroachDB and Axon, we discovered that uh, tracking event processors used um, a feature of Postgres, which uh, the people of CockroachDB deemed to be a feature that was never used. And um, their behavior caused uh, null pointer exceptions uh, to be thrown and whenever um, Axon was requesting a token, which happens at least once per second. So you had a lot of null pointer exceptions. Uh, we found a way um, around that um, by forking the, the driver. And we've been working with people on CockroachDB to find a solution for this. Um, luckily, they have uh, implemented a fix for this. And um, if you run Cockroach 20, version 20 or later, and Axon 4.3 or later, uh, there will be no problem in running post, uh, Cockroach in Postgres compatibility. Except for the second gotcha on CockroachDB, which is that the serial type, which Axon by default adds to the global index field of the domain event entry table, is not a continuous serial in Cockroach. Uh, CockroachDB tries to optimize this serial by um, creating it a globally unique identifier instead of having to create an um, ever-increasing series of numbers. Uh, you can fix this. Uh, if you want to do that, you have to do a little trickery to, um, to make sure the DDL uh, matches to what Axon expects. Um, it's not that uh, difficult. You can uh, start your command handle for the first time, it will uh, generate and execute the DDL uh, used to create the domain event table. And once that's done, you can stop the command handler again and execute the, the um, SQL statements in this uh, slide, where basically you will be creating your own sequence, which is uh, continuously increasing. And you put that as a default value for the global index column in uh, the domain event entry table. Once this is done and you start the command handler back up, uh, Axon works just fine. Um, the global index value will be increased uh, on every new event and there will be no problem uh, running Axon on CockroachDB anymore. This brings us to the next se section of this session about runtime situations. The previous part was mostly about design decisions uh, on architecture and uh, underlying tooling. Um, the following are some lessons learned from running Axon in production and having to deal with everyday situations. The first one is about uh, how we are used to looking at introducing new features into our system. Um, when we're thinking about introducing a new system, usually you think about how it's, uh, a user is creating uh, traffic on this particular feature. So you'll be thinking about the, the browser uh, sending like a command to the command handler, which then results into new events, which results, results into a new projection. And then finally, a service which can um, give the result back to the client. This is the natural way of thinking about how a feature is used. Uh, but there's, there are a few problems with uh, using this order when introducing new features. 
uh, when you're doing this, you will most likely have to restart projections at some point when, uh, when you if you first implement the command handler, um, and then finally um, start creating proje uh, projection, and then uh, at the end create your service. Uh, there's also a period of time in which the meaning of your service may be undefined because you are putting things in the projection in your view model which may not yet be supported by the, the view model. Uh, your UI may want to request things that it can simply not yet uh, answer. And um, basically, if you're trying to introduce a feature in this order, there's a high chance you will end up with a, a Big Bang release in which you have to release both the command handler, the projection, and the service all at the same time to make sure that everything is working at the same time. Uh, so you will be in this order. You'll be updating a command handler first, uh, and when you release that, uh, it's going to emit its first event before any of the projections are even supporting it. And after that, if you update the event handlers, they may have to be restarted because um, if events have already come in um, before it was updated. Uh, and lastly, the UI is um, only able to validate its, um, its functionality after everything has been released. Uh, so to mitigate this, we have decided actually to reverse the order. Uh, and now every time we create an, a, new, uh, a new feature, we do it the other way around. Uh, we start thinking about the contract from the UI with the service. Uh, this contract is then made explicit by creating a mock and the UI can start implementing it already. And once the service uh, here is able to uh, properly respond to uh, requests from the, from the interface, uh, then we start creating the projection which will fill in the information here. It also gives us the, avail uh, the ability to let the, the service uh, send sort of default responses while there is no information yet in the, uh, in the database, or at least it can already perform the actual queries that it has to do in the future. Then once that's done, we start creating the projection, which we can test uh, with, um, uh, with events that we introduce ourselves. And uh, once we're satisfied with how the projection is filling the, the tables of the view model, then we'll go back and introduce the command handling and even uh, aggregate information in the command handler. Um, in which case, once that's done, uh, the entire feature has been introduced and we can allow the um, user interface to start sending commands and trigger the new feature. Um, this has been uh, rather successful for us because it feels like a proper expand contract method. Uh, we are building uh, parts of a system that are capable of handling um, the situation in which the, their uh, supplying parties are not yet supplying the new things. So we can make it, we can make the system expect things before it actually has to handle them. One of the biggest advantages is that it will work from the very first event. Uh, that's emitted by the new feature. Uh, since we've already built the view model service as well as the projection ahead of the um, actual handling of the commands and emitting of the events, as soon as the first client actually um, sends a command and emits an event, the entire chain is already operational and um, it will simply work. And another um, big advantage here is that uh, the user interface can integrate fast. The, um, the service view model can either supply default answers or we can use mocks to allow it to, um, to allow the, uh, the user interface to already develop the part of the application showing the new data. So to sum up, what we're doing here is we sometimes add a new endpoint to the service and the view model side, uh, or we update an event, uh, and, and or we update an endpoint if it's um, able to simply expand the response of something. 
Then we update the event processes to fill in the database for the service. And lastly, we update the command handler to actually be able to emit the new events. And then uh, we can emit the first event and the feature has been implemented. Our next topic is repairing and adding state. So why does this happen? Well, one of the reasons is simply systems grow. And when systems grow, you learn about new information that you need um, and or maybe new information that you needed to go to before. Uh, your events will evolve, your aggregates will evolve, your projections will evolve. And some of these things may need to be uh, repaired um, all the way back into your event stream. For example, if a new field to an aggregate is introduced that um, may or may not have a very obvious default value, there is probably some repairing you will have to do. Uh, sometimes you have situations where implicit data becomes explicit. And what this means is that where you used to uh, deduce certain information simply from another event, uh, maybe the client now wants an explicit event for this um, to happen. And then um, the handling of that will change uh, based on the time of an event in your event stream. Uh, and it's, it sometimes it just helps to introduce certain repair events, which make the entire as um, the entire situation explicit, rather than just um, trying to figure out whether the current event is before or after a certain period in time. Uh, and another reason is you may have, have actually released a bug, and when a bug uh, creates information in events that's incorrect, um, you may have to um, correct that uh, in a way that on can only be corrected by emitting an event that corrects the state. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, don't edit the stream. Uh, this sounds like a, a Ghostbusters uh, don't cross the streams thing, but one of the big um, Plus, uh, one of the important features of event sourcing is that your stream of events should be considered immutable. Um, especially if you're promising clients uh, things like um, uh, immutability, auditability, and the safety of all data from the beginning of time, you should not be editing your stream. Uh, besides, if you're editing your stream, you have to make sure that all applications are down, all your projections are down, your command handles are down, uh, because you will be running into a pile of trouble if you're editing the stream when applications are still reading from it. Uh, so what's uh, a better way to do it is to introduce something that's called a repair something something command. And the uh, goal of this command is simply to um, allow your aggregate to repair the uh, situation that has occurred and emit an event that, um, that's uh, legitimate according to your domain. And it's actually fine to have events that um, uh, contain, for example, a JIRA issue number in which you can say, okay, this is the event that we emitted for a certain aggregate based on uh, JIRA issue 1234 to correct the something uh, the, the missing ownerships, for example. Um, and this is, uh, this is something we are using um, regularly when we have to do things like this. Uh, we create an explicit event that actually tells whoever reads it later that we were doing some repairing here on state in the events stream. And if you're able uh, to clean up the, uh, the code doing this repair, then you should also be doing that. The events will, be, uh, will exist until the end of time, uh, but you can, in some situations, clean up the commands triggering the repairs uh, if the repair is a one-shot. Um, a one-shot operation. Uh, this will make sure your code base stays clean 
and nobody will be able to accidentally trigger a repair that's no longer needed. Um, so this uh, this this is a pattern we use a lot when when something needs to be repaired on our aggregates. We introduce a command that um, emits a specific event generating the repaired data, and then uh, once we've uh, triggered the repairs on all of our aggregates, uh, then we remove the command handling part again to make sure that we can never accidentally do it again. So, in summary, uh, let's look back at some of the things I've been talking about. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, I was talking about how we've uh, separated our projections uh, into different services um, where they can be independent um, and turned on and off where needed. Um, I've shown you also how we've decided to move the token location from the database of the event stream to the database of the projection. Uh, making the projections even more independent from each other and lowering the load on the database containing the uh, event stream. Um, I've talked about how we've had a central domain um, project versus contracts between two services and how the second one um, gives you more flexibility in terms of uh, deployments, uh, making them smaller and more manageable. Uh, I showed you also how we are using non-strict deserialization to uh, make sure that the downstream applications do not break uh, when we are adding fields to things like events or other parts of a contract. I've also talked about how we are testing our serialization and deserialization to prevent uh, the introduction of bugs on uh, a level where event processors may um, no longer be able to deserialize a class and thus skip events, which in, in turn will need repairs. Um, I've shown you how we've uh, switched to CockroachDB as a cloud native database running under uh, Axon. Uh, I've talked about how we've reversed um, the order in which we introduce new um, features according to, uh, well, as opposed to the um, order in which features are used, uh, allowing also for more of an expand contract uh, method for growing a system. And I've shown you how we are handling um, situations in which either we forgot to add information uh, to a system or when a system grows it requires new data or when explicit data um, or implicit data becomes explicit in the future. Uh, I've shown you how we are using repair commands, emitting specific repair events and then later cleaning up the repair commands to make sure and that the uh, operations can be performed only once. That's it for my session. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, if you're uh, watching this on the conference day, you can uh, ask questions uh, in the chat and I will be happy to answer them.